uh, all across the, the, uh, the Middle East, people were looking for the fountain of youth. And then they, before that, Alexander the Great, very interesting, way before the time of Christ, spent time looking for the fountain of youth. And even Herodotus before that was looking for the fountain of youth. So there's a whole history of people who were searching for this thing because youthfulness is something that all of us want. Um, if you just can imagine, you know, uh, the way that you look at young people and what they can do with their bodies these days, you know, it's amazing. They're, they can just twist that old back of theirs as they raise open their arms and they kick their legs up behind them. And if you're still young, you think, of course we do that, you know, but once you get a little older, you realize that, that that's quite a little feat. Um, I remember uh, I used to play soccer. Uh, growing up. And then I was tried to play it again, you know, about, a, well, about five years ago. And I couldn't believe how I was moving like an old man. Now, I, even though my mind knew exactly what to do, my body just looked like an old man moving. And, and it was embarrassing. That's why I haven't played it in five years because I couldn't get over this. I'm going to turn, close my light off here. So it's a little bit nicer for you. We share that, right? It's part of our experience as, as human beings to, to, to long for that youthfulness. And interestingly, Christ died young. Uh, he died when he was 33. The Virgin Mary conceived Christ young. We don't know her actual age, but it seems likely that she was in her teens uh, when she conceived our Lord. Um, uh, 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 the sterility that can't comes by nature upon women in their old age is looked at as something that God even tends to want to renew. He seems to be on the side of the young. He's like, oh, you're old, but like a young woman, there you are, right? And they're so happy to have that happen to them. Uh, and no one complains about it. No one says, no, I'm really happy to be old. You know, you don't really, you don't really find that. Even Ebenezer uh, in the Bible, who's one of the old, old fellows who gives a witness in his old age, does so thinking about the young and talking about the young. Um, the oldness is, of course, held in high esteem. You can find many different quotes in the Bible about the elders and, and, and how good that is. But so, too, is youthfulness. And the elder, elder uh, uh, honor given to elders is given to those who are wise. And what we honor about the elders is that they know uh, things about God. What we honor about young people is that they are strong and it's the place of combat. I'm thinking of first John where it says, I, I speak to you fathers because you know, the one who is from the beginning. And I speak to you children, you know, because whatever. And I speak to you young men because you have conquered the evil one. David, for example, is anointed young and he kills uh, Goliath when he's an early teen. If you go back and do the math of David's age, he would have been an early, early teen, ready in his youth uh, when he actually slays Goliath and begins his career. Even when he's the king of Jerusalem, he's named king at 33, right? You, you guessed it. So there's a real emphasis in, in the scriptures. Uh, again, there's lots in there that honors the old, but never for being old. It honors the old for being wise. But youthfulness has a trait that is like God and that hard people are attracted to. And it's something that Jesus wants to keep inside of us and wants us to keep like, uh, you know, uh, like oil in our lamp. Um, and you can see this, for example, in the, in the uh, book of Revelation, where it speaks about blessed is the one who overcomes, the one who conquers. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, of course, held in the tradition of St. John, one of the apostles, actually being young. That's why he's never portrayed with a beard, because he would have been called when he was a young man. It's one of the reasons Thomas Aquinas gives for St. John being called the beloved, is that he would have been called the beloved because he would have been the youngest. Also, you have the special love that God has for the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, you least of all the tribes of Israel from you shall come forth, you know, the, the Messiah. So this idea of, of Bethlehem, um, and the tribe is the, the or, or not sorry, Bethlehem, Benjamin, Benjamin, which is the smallest of the tribes, the littlest one, the last of the tribes has a special love in the heart of the father. Um, so 
again, you know, what does this mean for us and how do we find this fountain of youth that people sought for? What, what is the secret to staying young in our love? I think, again, if you think of in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter two, where the, the correction to the church, where God, the Holy Spirit says to the church, you have lost your first love. Repent from where you have fallen. Right. You have lost your first love. Repent. So that first love, that freshness of the springtime, that youthfulness of soul is something that God looks for and wants for us. First of all, you could ask why. Why is it so important? Well, I think it's so important because God himself never ages. He remains always in, you can't even use words to describe it, but properly speaking, God is always young because he is always new. He's ever ancient, ever new, right? And so it's, of course, a contradiction for our human mind because we can't think outside of time. But God is outside of time. He is eternal. And because he is outside of time and outside of measurement, He's always being born, so to speak, even though he's not born, right? So he, our words can't describe it. The closest thing you can get to God is a spring of water coming up from the earth. And I had an experience of this that I'd love, if you're bored right now and you're not watching on your webcam, you can Google an image of Big Spring, Missouri. I got to go to Big Spring, Missouri, and guess what I found there? A big spring. <laughs> if you ever get to go to Big Spring, it's amazing. It's probably 10 feet in diameter, and it's just pure water coming straight out of the ground. I mean, it's a it's a big spring. <laughs> it's, it's, and it, but it's beautiful. And a river flows right out of it. But what's so amazing about Big Spring is that it's always old but always new. It's an image of God. You look at it and the water is flowing right out of it, but in it, it's new. And that newness is captured in the spring. That's an image of God. God never gets old. He never grows old. He always is in that gift. Now, what else is therefore always in that newness of the gift? It'd be the Holy Spirit, right? So, of course, God, the Trinity himself, it's always, but the Holy Spirit flows forth from the union of the Father and the Son. And you can't even really say that because, again, in time, that means that there was a beginning and then the Holy Spirit flowed forth. But there, it's an eternal, God is an eternal mystery of, of motion in, that never moves. And just meditate on that for a moment because it's so beautiful. Go back to that image. Big spring. Look it up. Watch a YouTube video of it. It'll blow your mind. Water coming out of the earth. And as it comes out of the earth, it's replaced instantly. It's forever in a self gift. Well, that's the, that is the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. He is eternally proceeding. And yet he never leaves. But I'm not going to focus on the never leaving. It's that he's eternally proceeding. So God's very mystery is... Uh, uh, <laughs> is a mystery of, of, of giving forth. They, they use the term in Latin, spiration for the Holy Spirit. And that's, of course, awesome, but it means nothing in English. <laughs> but spirate, to spirate. And, and it's funny because when you read the English translation, I was going to turn around and grab my summa. Because when you read the English translation, that's what they use. They say it spirates the Holy Spirit. And you're like, that's not even a word. But theologians don't care about you or care about me, right? They just care about themselves, saying words that no one understands. They don't care about me because then they put me in front of you and they're like, you better entertain them and keep their intent, their, their attention while you talk to them about the spiration of the Holy Spirit. You're like, this is not helping. But the word comes from the Latin word spear, which means breath, breathing, like inspire or expire to breathe out, to breathe in. When you're inspired, you go inspired, right? Well, he, the Holy Spirit is breathed out. He spirates from the union of the Father and the Son eternally, which means the Holy Spirit is eternally new. Just like the Son is eternally new. 
In this day, I have begotten you. It's uh, right in the letter of the Hebrews. This day, we got you. Wait a second. Like you're eternally God. He's like, that's right. Every day I've begotten you. But then again, I'm, you're never begotten. You're the unbegotten begotten. Welcome to the Trinity. But if you see that you have, you have the father, if he begets the son, eternally becoming a father for the first time, whose son is eternally being born, even though he's not, right? He's not. But then again, he's, there he goes, right? The son eternally and the two of them giving forth the Holy Spirit eternally. What it's telling us is that God himself is a mystery of youthfulness. So when we talk about youthfulness, we're not talking about immaturity, obviously. So the youthfulness that we're looking at spiritually is not that we all be little kids running in the fields and just so happy without a care in this world. No, but it means that, that we don't, we, we haven't grown old in the sense of having missed the core of who we are. Youthfulness in the spiritual life looks like someone who is solidly in their identity. If you want to know, so what is he talking about? What does youthfulness look like? It looks like you centered in who you are. When, it, when, when now you can go from your marriage, for example, and you see what that looks like. It's your first love. When you guys are doing well, and not just well, but when you have those moments uh, where you are, your marriage is actualized and fresh, <laughs> see, youthful images, and, and where the two of you are, are, are of one heart, right? At those moments, it's almost like you're, you, you, you give birth out to, again to your identity. It's like, this is what I was made for. I was made for you. And the two of us are living what we're supposed to be living. And there's an energy, there's a freshness. If you describe youthfulness, you'd use those terms. There's a strength, there's a joy, there's a peace. And it, but if you were to go beyond the description and say, where does it come from? It comes from the two of you being where you need to be, where you're supposed to be, i.e. realigning all of your actions based back onto your identity. You, so we are the two of us living a marriage that comes from this original source, this love that right now is present and actualized and it's there and it's right in front of us. And if we can, the more that we can stay close in that love and, and the more that our actions are natural, funny, wonderful, life-giving, it's like two young people when they're flirting, you know, or married people when you're flirting, you know, it's kind of wonderful to see married people flirting, right? Why do you like to flirt? You live with each other. You know, it's like, well, you know, you, come on. But it's like, no, you could sit there and at your, on your little date nights, you guys could spend an hour and a half flirting and flirting never gets old. A person, you can flirt for it. It just, the more you do it over your little text together, you like kind of like send that and they send that and you send that. And you don't even want to stop looking at your phone because you're actually like flirting with each other. And what is that, right? That's, the, that's what I mean by youthfulness. It's nothing to do with a bodily age. It has everything to do with you being at your source, being at your core. And from your marriage, when it's at your core, you flirt. It's just a beautiful thing. When, when a family is in its youthfulness, it's like those Friday nights when you watch just the perfect movie and everybody's in that movie and you're all just vibing together and laughing at the right time. And the kids are just kind of like silly, but it's a wonderful silliness and it's not even a bad silly. And right. And you're just like, we don't ever want this night to end. And the kids fall asleep right there underneath their little blankets on the floor. And dad gets to carry them up and put them into bed. And you're like, we like, there was no time when you no longer notice time, you know that you're doing something right. And that's, but where does that come from? That's the description. Where does it come from? It comes from you being in your identity. You leadership of your family was just perfect. You stopped what you were doing. You rented just the right movie. You bought just the right ice cream. The timing of the day was just right. And you governed and watched that and created that evening so that your kids and your family could all just be yourselves. See how that youthfulness is linked 
identity, core, who you are. You heard me say all those things. And when you're aligned, your actions are flowing like a river from the big spring. And in Missouri, you can see it. The big spring's coming up and they dug it. They made it real nice and clean. They dug the ditch and the river's just going shoom, like gallons and gallons of water just flowing right out of this thing. And, and that's, that's the picture of youthfulness. When what we're doing now comes from who we really are, what we're doing now feels youthful. So the spirituality of youthfulness is one of learning how to defend and promote our true identity. Say that again. Spirituality of youthfulness comes from defending and promoting our true identity. So what's the secret of the fountain of youth? So the fountain of youth is the Trinity. Fountain of youth is God. And when I can encounter God in truth, I mean, when St. Paul encountered Christ, scales fell from his eyes, like old age. When I gaze upon the Trinity, when I see God, the weight of the day disappears. I'm able to, there's a story of a priest who, who told this story. He was in a sacristy in Rome and he was getting ready for mass. And he was trying to, to pray, but the kids, the youth, the, the, the altar boys were poking each other. And what all usually happens in the sacristy, just in case any of you guys are sacristans, I would encourage you, let the priest pray, you know? But it's not what happens. Usually, like, the old guy shows up, and he's back there, hey there, Father Nate, how you doing? You know, and I'm just like, I'm about to offer the eternal sacrifice, you know, of the Holy Mass, Christ Jesus, my Lord, in my fingers. And you're like, how am I doing? I'm like, I'm doing good, Bob. How you doing? How's your cat? You know, and you're throwing your stuff on, talking about your cats. And, and you don't mean anything by it because you guys are just being friendly because you're living in the world. And that's what worldlings do. You talk about cats and, you know, it's awkward to be silent. But do your priest a favor. I mean, unless he's a real social guy and he wants to talk. Most priests were trained not to talk before mass. You're actually trained to pray, but they always talk because we feel like we have to be nice to you guys because you come in asking us how we're doing and how our car is. And you feel like that's your time to bond with father when he's actually trying to be alone. That's your chance to bond with that guy. You know, don't do that. Uh, instead, just kind of pray with him because it's actually a real deep and intense moment where you see a man preparing to lay down on the altar and self-sacrifice himself. It's pretty intense. So that being said, that's usually not what happens. So don't feel bad. You're just like everywhere else. I usually stay in the car a little bit longer and say, and get myself focused on the car so I can go in the sacristy and be nice to people. Because <laughs> if, if you're not, then people are like, oh my gosh. And they go out, they're like, Father, it's such a jerk. He's back there, blah, blah, blah. He think he wants to pray or something. I mean, you know, what do you think we are? He doesn't love people. <laughs> people are pretty tough on this priest. So we're out in the car praying, you know, or you go to the bathroom, you're like, excuse me, I need to use the restroom just so you can like pray, you know, because everyone's back. So this was happening. Everyone's dancing around, poking each other. And so this priest, he was just like, I didn't know what to do because like, I mean, this is just, so he just, he just bowed his head and started to pray. And he said, it was like a ripple went out from him through the room and progressively everyone else in the room began to pray. That's youthfulness. When you pray, you pierce, you pierce through all the drama, all of the stress, all of the anxiety of your life. And you, you, you encounter the one who is over the whole world. And, I mean, all of us have anxiety. All of us have a hard time sleeping. You know, all of us have terrible threats from our health. Oh, we're overweight. We're worried about our job. Our new manager's a jerk. We're going to lose our retirement, you know. Uh, you know, you're going to lose your good name. Someone's going to accuse you of something, you know, and maybe they're even right, you know, but like, even if they're right, they're wrong. Cause I mean, it was 15 years ago, you know, but like, that doesn't matter. Right. And you got, Oh, and you're just kind of thinking like, I'm going to some, I actually did this, you know, in my house and I didn't declare it on the form. Are the people going to come back and they're going to get me even after I sold the house, I should have, but I couldn't declare we had, Oh, the taxes you didn't pay. Oh, right. And you just live and some of you carry these burdens around for 15, 20 years, you know, and it's just there. There, it's this monkey on your back and it never lets go. 
right? It'll make you old, right? It'll just sap you. But you're no longer living from your identity because your identity has been clouded over by something else. And you just kind of let it because you don't know what to do with it. So I'm, I'm living kind of like not. And we apologize by not shining. We, our lives lose their luster of youthfulness because we, we've been assailed by terrible things that have just slugged us in the heart. And we're walking kind of like drudging our feet through life. Even if we don't do it physically, we do it spiritually. You'll see this in a marriage. It's kind of like, you know, can a man once old go back into his mother's room and, womb and be born again? Is there really hope for our family I mean, after we pretty much set the course and we, we didn't do a really good job with it. I mean, and now the kids are grown. And, you know, when I go listening to these talks by the Schluters all the time. And they're always, oh, you go so peppy. But what am I going to do? Our family is what it is. You know, that's a terrible saying. It is what it is, by the way. You know, instead of like it, it, what it can be. Wouldn't it be like it is something that can be better? Like, no, no, no. It is what it is. Like and what's happened to our hearts? We've accepted that there's a division between our core and our actuality. We've accepted that the river is, is flown from the spring and the spring is unattainable. And I'm just floating down the river of life, getting further and further away of who I really am. Life, in other words, has taken me where it wanted me to go instead of me swimming and staying in that vibrancy of saying, I am a new creation. You know, like St. Paul may have sinned, but he, his sin was forgiven. And though I may have suffered many trials, God will wipe them all away. He makes all things new and he's made me new. And there is no condemnation for him who is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And in fact, the Holy Spirit takes those, it makes us run and not grow weary and walk without go, being faint. Guys, do you believe this? Or have you accepted the old age of your spirit as a kind of prison of your past so that my present is out of my control because my past was lost by whatever it was? If someone else has come into your life and taken you in a course, down a course where you feel like you are not who you are, welcome to redemption. Jesus Christ wants to come into your life to plunge you into the Trinity. <laughs> to plunge you into newness. There is hope in Christ Jesus who says to you, though your past be like scarlet, I will make it as white as snow. I will take your sins and move them as far from you as the East is from the West. I mean, for all of its ages, has Perrysburg ever been united with mommy? No. Yeah. So it shall be for your sins. Your sins will be over in Perrysburg and your soul and mommy and the two shall never come together again. This is the imagery that, that God's giving. Obviously I'm from St. Joe's <laughs> anyway. And all that beautifulness, that's a, a proclamation. I'm going to correct my camera here. Don't worry. That's a proclamation to you. That's, that's powerful from, from the heart of God. Look into your life, look into your spouse's life. This is what's great if you're married. What a gift you have. You have someone else. And, and maybe ask your spouse, am I young? And be honest. Because you don't know, you could be young. You know, I'm looking at the Reinhardts. They're the picture of youth over there. You know, I say, that, yeah, I'm young. Yeah, well, you know, ask your wife. I don't know, Andrew. You know, what's she going to say? Because like, are you young? Meaning, do you, are you, you know, right? Like, are you who you want to be? That when a man is who he wants to be, he becomes young. When a woman is who she wants to be, she's young. It's your, when you claim your identity, you live in that heart of that identity, you're young. Now, that's really great because it gives you a little key to working with one another in your marriage. Because now you're like, okay, I want you to be young again. Where do I get that? It's by going back and finding out how I can foster your true identity how I can liberate it. What lies are in you right now? Who has told you you were naked, says God to Adam and Eve? Who told you you were naked, right? Who told you that you were dumb? Who told you you were condemnable? Who told you that you didn't have a future? Who told you that your kids were out of your, your control? Who told you that it's too late for you to reform your family? Who told you these things? I'll tell you what God says. He says, all things are possible for him who believes in me. He says all things are possible. Even a man could be born again. And unless he be born again, he will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
<laughs> so Nicodemus, you're not allowed to be old, bro. You gotta go back into that womb. You gotta find that source of, of youthfulness because finding youthfulness is finding God. So how do you do that? I want you number one for yourself to lay hold of hope. The, 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 the source, the fountain of youth is hope. Hope means I got to live for God. I may have blown it. I may have all kinds of past. I may have baggage. I may have things I'm worried about and lawsuits pending and whatever. But I'm looking at God who loves me and he's giving me my name. My name is not pronounced by the mouths of the devils. My name is pronounced by God. I mean, it's interesting that Jesus, for example, would not let the devils proclaim him. It's very interesting. In the New Testament, the devil's like, I don't know who you are, the son of God. He says, silence. But he bids us to proclaim him. Why? Because the devil doesn't know your name. He doesn't know your identity because he doesn't know God. Jesus, his name will not be invoked by the devil. He will not allow it. It's on the contrary. So it's the same thing for you and me. And it's to look to God and to, to live in God and to have your hope in God and to not let that go. When you do that, then your next step, when I put my heart in God, my next step then is to look around my life and to say, what is it that's forcing me to believe the lie? Where are the lies? Let me uproot them. And spouses do this for each other, please, please. And when your spouse starts fighting for your soul, wives, let him. It's the craziest thing. Women wanted the men to lead. As soon as the men started leading, then they're like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're not going there. It's like, oh, my gosh, I know. I know it's hard to forgive, but, like, you just got to get build a bridge and get over it, okay? Because you need your husband to help you say, honey, that's a lie. You are wonderful, right? And it's the same thing. There's lies in the heart. What men, what happens to men is we get the lie in our heart that we're no good, that we're not a good leader, that our wife doesn't love us. And therefore, we just we, then we fulfill the prophecy. When we sense that we're not wanted, we make ourselves not wantable. It's, it's, it's just the way of life. So fight for each other by getting rid of the lie. Then the third thing you could do is say, what's one thing I can do? One. That, that, that is me. This is me. And yeah, it could be kind of silly, but... It, it, some of it's not silly, but then again, if it's, if it's not, if it's real, even if it's silly, you need it. The thing that makes you, you, that it's like you're a special identity in God. And of course it's prayer, but then again, there's also things that you can do that are you. I'm thinking, for example, of saying, I love you to each other from the heart. Uh, it's like a, a moment. I'm thinking of laughter. I'm thinking, of course, of hobbies, too. But it's things that, that you learn to do to promote that, that uniqueness of yourself, okay? Youthfulness is being like God. I'll sum this up. Youthfulness is being like God. It's you living in God, right? The sign of, you, or the sign of youthfulness is freshness, strength, joy, all the gifts of the Spirit, because the Spirit, like I said, is eternally new. Always remember that. So this, the source of fountain of youth is the Holy Ghost and the Trinity. So great. Uh, where, what do I do to get it? I go back to my identity, and I align my actions to my identity. So the leadership of me over my wife is that I align me and my wife, our marriage to our identity. We're making sure that what we're doing now is flowing from our union of love. And then what do we do if I'm the head of a family? I go back and I look for my family identity. And I put my identity and my family there. And I fight, then I, then I clear out the lies and I promote the truth of my identity in God. And when we do that, folks, the world is renewed and we're made young. I put it this way to sum up, I think youthfulness is not optional. It's something we don't talk about a lot because as you can tell, it's a little bit hard to talk about. It's not the easiest thing. A talk on purgatory would have been a lot easier, Greg. (laughs) But instead he gives me a talk on youthfulness. But it is essential. It is essential because it's part and parcel of, of living, how did he put it, of living in truth with respect to God. I think I've used up my time, so I will. You can go another more, a few more hours if you'd like, Father. I'm sure we'll see the nods of everybody here acknowledge that. 
but I got to pronounce that that was one of the most epic, consequential, on point, relevant, needed messages that I have. I've never heard. Now, I'm just minuscule, but I think this message of youthfulness, the eternity and being drawing us back into our nature in God, husbands and wives. You got to write a book on that. I, I have never heard that message before. And I think it, it is stirring. And even the steps, you know, there's so much here that's meant to unpack. You got to do a conference on that or something, because I think many of us, some of us are young, like you pointed out the Reinhardts, although they're old souls, they're very wise souls. We see them, a lot of wise souls. But I think there are many of us who've, who've, who become crusty. Uh, many of us who become starchy, many of us who, like you say, wounds of life, dealing with things, but our deepest soul is yearning for what you said, for that sense of vitality of Christ alive within us, which is youthful. So first of all, thanks, um, folks. We're going to scrap the, the uh, small groups um, and, and receive Father until he says, I have to go, and then we'll let him go. Because he may have to go to confession or not him go to people may have like last time you had confessor, you had people who were confessing, whatever. But are there any questions while we have you and reserve father in your time, at least 30 seconds to give us a good blessing. So you just say, hey, I got to go. We're going to keep it very real. Um, anybody questions? Steph, Steph took a voracious notes on this. And I find in my spirit um, in this holy week uh, coming back, being drawn deeper into this place, you know, Christ died for this. He died in the sacraments, right? They exist for us to experience this. But how often, maybe speak to this, how often maybe do people expect this when they receive the sacraments, but because they don't connect subjectively what God is wanting to give us in the gift that they may become inoculated against the power and the purpose of the sacraments. And we are speaking to us a sense of recovery. This is what Christ did and does. I don't know if you agree with that or thoughts on that. When you look at all the sacraments, all save two, namely marriage and uh, ordination, they're all about restoring life and therefore restoring youthfulness. You're born in confession. You are strengthened in confirmation, right? Strengthening more life given to you. You're fed and nourished when you're hungry in the Blessed Sacrament. You are forgiven, meaning given new spiritual life in, in the sacrament of, the, of confession. You are anointed with healing in the anointing of the sick. And then you have your two uh, vocational sacraments, both of which are there as the, the, the framework for your journey. Yeah. But life being a journey, God is there always renewing. It's actually a sign of spiritual discernment. When you have a spirit of old age that comes upon you in the bad sense, it's a sign. Death is not from God. Uh, we're supposed to even die young, not die young in terms of age on earth. But your soul, you know, when, you, when you've been around, I'll give you an example, been around the saints, you know, and as a priest, I, I get to watch, I get to watch you who are holier than any priest I've ever met. You know, uh, you come to, when you come to confession, I'm sitting there taking notes for myself, you know, going like, yeah, that's one. And you're an admiration of the humility of these souls. When you go to confession, everyone go humbly, don't hide it. Mm -hmm. but you don't have to go dramatic, but when you meet people who are just, they're more aware of God's beautiful mercy than you are. Mm. It, it, it's amazing. Well, I was thinking of a sister of the visitation off of Parkside Boulevard. And I got to go in and, and bless her as she was preparing for her death. Mm. And um, I, so I, I was there. They, they escorted me into her bedside and she's, she's laying there. She's just like a little peanut in the bed. I mean, she's just like, there's nothing to her. And she had a little bonnet on, you know, and they had her all tied up, you know, tucked up because Father Nathan was coming in, you know, so their blanket was up to here and she just this little head on her pillow, you know. And, and I said, sister, you know, um, as I was leaving, I said, I've got a van full of young adults out there. I'm taking them to the March for Life. Do you have any message for them? And she said, tell them it's not easy to live like a Catholic, but it sure is easy to die like one. Wow. wow youthfulness you know there's our saint therese saying i will do more from heaven than i i could on earth i sense that i'll be more active in heaven 
Uh, you just wait and see, she said, well, how much I'll be doing in heaven, right? She said, I desire to labor in heaven, even when I'm dead, for souls until the end of the world when there's no more laboring to have. But I wouldn't want anyone to be working when I'm up there in heaven if, you know, youthfulness. Or they're saying the same St. Therese, she was in the, she was a sick with tuberculosis. I mean, and she was having a spiritual crisis for a year and a half of her life where she felt like she was an atheist, felt, felt like God didn't love her. And she's in her, the, the, the room and they, they come in, they find Therese pacing back and forth on the floor. She's going back and forth. and like, what are you doing? Get back in bed. You're sick. You know, she's coughing up blood and everything. And she goes back in bed, obedient. And then they say, what were you doing? And she said, I was walking for a missionary. Mm-hmm. Meaning she was offering up her struggles of walking so that some priest somewhere would have the energy. Mm-hmm. And I, I share that with you because many of you feel like all you can do is pray, quote unquote. And I just like to point out that that's, that's actually all that you really need. Um, so it, there's some, some stories there, but that, that idea of the youthfulness is at the heart of the, the lives of the saints. It's at the heart of who we are. And so, yes, Greg, like we have to fight against that because God is always bringing us back to life. We are the ones who condemn ourselves because we listen to the spirit of, of negativity and the lie. And e, the thing is, is that the devil, remember that the, uh, the definition of the devil in the book of Revelation is the accuser, the accuser of our brothers, right? So when you feel that accusation or when your wives accuse you, <laughs> just easy, just easy. you know where that comes from, that, uh, that spirit of accusation, because it could be right. I mean, who of us can stand? We fall seven times a day. Lord, if you counted our, our iniquities, Lord, who could stand? And the answer is no one. We are guilty. The accusation is right. The devil's not dumb. He's not making it up. He's not lying that you sin. And he's not lying that you're miserable. <laughs> he's just lying that your sin or your misery has cut you off from God. And the spiritual combat is for us to constantly stay in that hope, that low Even if I walk in the valley of darkness, you are there with me, with your rod and your staff. You never abandon me, ever. Go back and read John chapter 10. It's these verses that I've never heard priests preach about, but I wish that they would. So I became one. So then I end up having to preach about it. But here it is twice in John 10, where Jesus says, "Uh, you are in my hand and no one can take you from my hand. Mm. It's like such a line. Why isn't that? And everybody's motto, you know, they're like, I, like no one can take me from the hand of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'm no one. Right. So then I, I got to like keep my eyes on him and I've just got to push forward despite my misery. But you see, like suddenly, instead of, if you look at a sign of oldness in, in the bad sense, you would see um, Elijah who crosses the desert running from King, uh, Ahab, not is it? What's the guy? Yeah, Ahab, Ahab. King Ahab, and he runs for forty days and forty nights across the desert, and he lays down on the ground wishing to die. Mm. This is Elijah. Right after he killed all those prophets, remember that one? He takes off running because they're trying to kill him, and he and he's, he wants to die, and he lays on the ground wishing that he would die. Mm. Um, and, and and so that's a sign of old age. And what happens? The angel appears and says, "Get up and eat." else the journey will be too long for you. Get up and eat. And there's like this God who's suddenly feeding him. And I don't want you to die. Mm. So keep that in mind, everybody. When, and when you feed on God, you push forward. You're not allowed to die. You're not allowed to quit. If you're still on this earth, it's because he's not done with you yet. Amazing. Before I ask another burning question, anybody else? Question or comment? I really resonated with what you were saying, Father, about um, just like being beat down by the cares of the world. And so we have five kids that are under nine and there's just so there's like a lot of cares of the world that I feel like is just like the daily drudgery can just just get too much. And so um, I feel like. I have this sense of like, I could just reclaim my joy. Like if only everyone would do what I tell them to, or if only the kids wouldn't fight or if only this, or if only this, or if only this. And I'm just wondering if you have any like practical suggestions for 
kind of how to reclaim that youthfulness and that joy, like in the midst of everyone is fighting or the baby is crying and we're trying to leave the house or like just this daily, you know, that's in the life of a mom. I'm sure there's other examples out there too, but um, like that daily grind, uh, like what can we do right then in the moment, you know, cause like every morning I'm praying like, okay, Lord, I don't want to do that again a day. And <laughs> two hours later, I'm still back in the, in the drudgery. And does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. It makes sense. Um, my answer to you is that uh, there's no hope. <laughs> no, it's just that realistically that you're not going to you're not going to be able to do it. I've never met anyone. Uh, even our lady, when she was a mother, her son was sinless. So she didn't have to worry about it too much. But the yes. rest of us, God, God seems I just to have that. <laughs> It says that, so what you need to do is not judge yourself so harshly and realize that you're doing awesome. Mm. You've got five kids and you're, you're bringing them to church. That's what I heard. <laughs> and so something that can help us with our inner peace is for us to accept, accept the messiness. Um, uh, if you're a boss and your, your people, your, your, your department's a mess, right? The thing that wearies our brains is when we're like, it shouldn't be this way. Mm. It should be different. And that's actually, that's actually a loss of spiritual energy because I am where I am. And actually God's allowed my kids to be throwing up and fighting because he wants me to be there <laughs> to teach them the, the ways. Mm -hmm. So like I was thinking about this just today, cause I just had a very long day at the office. It's, it's a seven twenty. I haven't stopped uh, yet. And <laughs> I've been up since 4 AM and I'm going to go to 11 PM tonight anyway. So, and I had a really hard day and I thought to myself, you know what? Pro leadership is made for problems uh, because that's why I'm a leader because there are problems. If there weren't problems, there wouldn't be any action. If there's action, there's problems. And so listen, with motherhood, it's the same thing. There you are. And you're saying to yourself, like, oh, I shouldn't be having the kids screaming. I'm like, actually, <laughs> no, that's why you're there. And if you can sink into that, mm -hmm. You won't find like joy, joy in the sense of, you know, in this disaster, but you will find peace of saying <laughs> my job right now are mm. these five little rascals and getting them to church alive and home again alive. And if they get there and back alive, I've done my job. You know, that's what I think. But I love to hear some other moms chip in too, because you guys are the experts. Beautiful. Patty or Doug. Okay. Hi, Father. Um, I just wanted to ask, see if you could um, talk about the grace that comes from our sacrament of marriage to help our children um, when they're struggling and when we're trying to lead them as parents and um, to make all things new, you know, what God does through our, the grace of our sacrament. Can you I would love to, to. That? you know, what I'd challenge is that Greg and Stephanie, you guys should do a retreat for these guys where you have a priest, just go through the nuptial blessing. Hmm. And it doesn't have to be a priest. It could be any theologian, someone who's trained, but going through the nuptial blessing and preaching that for everybody, because man, that's what you're asking for. When you got the nuptial blessing, the church put into words the blessings that come from the marriage bond. So what you've asked for is for me to talk about the marriage bond. When you're, when you're married, everybody, there, there's a, a bond. And the word in Latin is even better, vincula. And the vincula is the chain. It's the same word for chains. <laughs> and it's why you have a ring. Because the marriage ring is a bond. It's like I'm in shackles. <laughs> Sometimes you feel that a little bit more than others, but uh, that's just it. So that's you're, you're shackled, you're bound, right? And what it was symbolizing in the ring is the invisible bond that was made uniquely the moment the two of you got married. So everyone's marriage bond looks different. It looks, it, it's a gift because when the priest is doing the nuptial blessing, there's a line where he says, send forth your spirit. Now that's the same line that he used. We use at ordination for priests because there's a special sending of the spirit. The moment you're married and sending of the spirit, the moment that I was ordained that, that in, in that gift of the spirit, 
you have a new outpouring of grace. And so your bond of your marriage, that's what you asked me to describe. It's then the nuptial blessing after your wedding, your thing, the priest stands there and he gives all these graces to you. And so you can go back and find in that blessing, the description of what you're looking for. So what I would say to you is that when it comes to your children and keeping them in grace and keeping your family together, remember this, everybody, you have every grace that you need. He is sufficient and he is never going to abandon you. You will feel abandoned though. Please don't worry. It's like our dear mom who had to leave right there. I can see because her kids were probably screaming at each other. Uh, someone's ripped off their clothes and is running around the house. You know, <laughs> Who knows what's going on over there? But it's the same way. Like she's going to feel overwhelmed. There's just no, you know, there's no bones about it. Well, you're going to feel like there's no hope for your marriage. The feeling doesn't matter. That's where faith begins. When I don't feel anything, I choose to lean in on Christ, and then you have to dare the impossible. So the impossible seems like a conversation between the two of you. The impossible seems like saying you're sorry again. The impossible seems like, uh, you know, you dare the impossible, resting on the grace because you heard me tell you what happened the day you were married, and that's that God decided he would always be new inside of your marriage. Absolutely beautiful. We're going to land this. We could go for many hours. You've been up. Um, I want to maybe just make a point and then ask for your blessing that we really began with an awareness of the many travails and struggles throughout the world. We attended to Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa's very powerful statement. If you want to change the world, go home and love your family. And kind of weaving into my question, what might be another talk another time is if we've if we've experienced a culture of curmudgeons. Not just me personally and me discovering youthfulness. You like that culture of curmudgeons. Well, then it's affecting my wife and my kids and they're expecting me to be a curmudgeon. And, and there's a little bit of proving ground. There's a little bit of, of, of demonstration and I can't change them, but I can choose myself to come to the fountain of youth, which is Christ, and to live that fully and to be patient with those around me, whether it be my children or my spouse. And I think that's the beauty of this magnificent, most holy week of the year, as we uh, are so grateful for your priesthood, your yes, that we celebrate tomorrow night on Holy Thursday. Grace is so much being poured out. So brothers and sisters, let's conclude tonight availing to uh, the blessing of Father Nathan. And we're so grateful for you, Father, and your priesthood. Bless us. Your response is et cum spiritu tuo. You can practice et, et cum, cum spiritu, spiritu tuo. tuo. Perfect. Nice job. Dominus vobiscum. Et cum et spiritu, cum spiritu tuo. tuo. Two of you got it. The rest of you, it's close. You'll still get, you'll still get blessed. Dear God, I ask you to pour your, your blessing down upon the hearts of all these wonderful people. I ask you to encourage them, Lord, tonight. Renew them. May you all, on the grace of this Easter, be prepared to let go of what is past and to push forward to what is new. May the love of Jesus, the light of God, the peace of heaven mm. descend upon you. Et benedictio Dei omnipotentes, Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Descenda super vos, et mania sempre. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, folks. Hang out for just another second here. Father, you're standing up. We're going to say goodbye to the rest of you guys. Some landing points. you got three minutes left, and I will try to get through this in three minutes. So, um, first of all, uh, please do go to Father Nathan's uh, site, stjohninstitute.org. Play the video. Check it out. We are delighted to be really in an area where he visits frequently because it's his home turf and he travels throughout the country and um, really does some amazing things. But resources you can access online that have been profoundly powerful and you can find those resources there. Um, then we ask you, I'll send this to you in an email. I would be very grateful. We would be grateful if you filled out the power survey, I sent it to you both in text and email. Um, and what's that going to do? Well, number one, it's going to give us great feedback for how we can improve this. This is definitely a sandbox. I've never done it before. Tried to keep it to an hour. There are things I can tell you already know you'd change. 
Number two, what's next? Well, we're looking to I'll back up a little bit. Well, it's fine. Next, we are looking to do a series on this great book from Christendom to Apostolic Mission with a modifier in the home. So we are going to have a dynamic speaker yet to be revealed who will guide us through a series on this book that has been very consequential in awakening us to understand the nature of the culture, the political, the structures around us. We are not in Christendom anymore. And in, a lot, in many ways, we've been acting in a way as if it is Christendom. And to understand the apostolic age, what took place there, and really be formed by that and seek the grace to live, it, live fully in an era that we can be uh, engaging in, first and foremost, in our marriage and families is the goal of that series. It probably won't begin until, do we say June? Probably not until June. So stay tuned for that. And then, of course, we do ask that you partner with us. Um, the amount that we ask for, $40 a couple, as you might imagine, is a, a fraction of what it costs us to do this. We'd like to bless our speakers more. So um, whether you give to Father Cromley directly, which I do encourage you to do also, we want to be able to bless them also um, financially. So, But it also help us continue our mission. We rely 100% of course, prayer is at the foundation of all of that. And you can find that at massimpact.us forward slash partner. Finally, let's see here. Uh, classics. I'm going to ask you guys to lead, since you are the patriarch and matriarch maybe of this group, I'm going to ask you to please lead this daily parent blessing. Don't forget the, the intro, so important, calling on the name of Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, after the entering into the Trinity. I just make a note, we would love to see this in parishes throughout the world. There's no more formidable fighting force than grandparents and parents and godparents intentionally praying together and blessing their children, grandchildren, and godchildren. So you can find out more about that, msimpact.us forward slash prayer card. With no further ado, let's close this in prayer. Close six again. Lord Jesus Christ, let your holy anointing be upon each of our children, grandchildren, and godchildren this day. In your sacred name, we claim them for you. We renounce all whispers, lies, and influences of the enemy. We pray right now that each know your loving presence, be forged in virtue, and be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to live fully their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're going to hang if you want to chat a little more, uh, for at least for a bit. Ten. Or is that one? That's a one, Linda. Thank you. Oh, it's a ten. It's a ten. It's now mirrored. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect when I said youthful, truthfully. Like, I don't think he did either. <laughs> well, Most. such a fresh talk, fresh perspective. So yes. You did an amazing leading us all, Greg and Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Patty. You and Doug. Really, really appreciate you. Really yeah. was blessed this Lent. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, it was a great gift for us, too, for a Lent. We wanted to do something together as a couple this Lent. And it, yes. it just, and we, had, we never knew about your organization or anything no. about you. It's, One of our children went to Ave Maria and we were on a email list and i just happened to they shared the link just randomly one day it was so meant to be beautiful awesome. we're so blessed well god bless you all i don't want to cut out because it's so great to see your faces and i'm blessed by your witness and your pursuit of god and um let's keep praying for each other the enemy hates us <laughs> we've, ex yeah. we've experienced that we do That's here funny. right Yep. And uh, we're his target. And I think uh, to be just to see you and to know your hearts and minds has been just very formidable for us to have a kingdom focus and kingdom hearts in our own home. It's reverberated. So if not, I want to say if nothing else, far more than that, but just to be gathered in this way has been a tremendous blessing for us. So just prayers <laughs> that, uh, that, that, that you uh, we received from the different speakers or interactions or, you know, just the intentionality of God's grace alive and seeds mm -hmm. planted and conversation started and keep going and keep going, fill in the blank, but just that it just continues in your marriages and in conversation and your prayer together and in those struggles. And, um, 
just that the work that the Lord has begun here just mm-hmm. continues and it is brought into fruition as scripture says, but you and I have some, love you. you and I have some flirting to do. So All right, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> love you guys. Have a blessed Holy week. Let's Thanks be in so touch. Much.